Okay, welcome back to Quality Matters. I'm your host, Darcy Chambers. I'm Kyle. And we are back with our special guest, Matt Sands, the host of the Mineral Rights Podcast. Welcome back, Matt. Hey, thanks again for having me, uh, Kyle and Darcy. It's so good to talk to you again. All right. I'm going to cut you off. We're not going to talk about mineral rights this time. Maybe another time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But we're going to talk about quality and process improvement again and um, maybe how to implement it or the importance of implementing it throughout the whole business and not just in the manufacturing or for the operators, but in the office as well. In today's global economy, quality matters. Benjamin Franklin once quipped, The bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. Quality Matters is here to talk about all things quality. So whether you're looking to improve your business, getting ready for an audit, or dealing with failed inspections, tune in, check us out, then get back to doing work that matters. Yeah, and this is something that I um, have is kind of near and dear to my heart and some of my experience. I worked for Shell for about 16 years, and the last uh, assignment that I had the last four years or so was in our enterprise architecture program where we were implementing um, improvements to the way we manage process data and systems. And so I was in a position where we were looking after the integrated planning process. So it was totally based in the office. You know, we did interface with the folks in the field, but a lot of the work that we did was, you know, on the computer and manipulating data. And that was kind of the big um, product that we were, that we were producing, so to speak. And um, so, yeah, that was, that's something that's, uh, you know, definitely near and dear to my heart. Well, we're pretty passionate about it too. Obviously we're in quality (laughs) and, um, you know, the thing we encounter most is buy-in for everyone and, um, getting everyone to use the program all the time. Yeah. And and buy-in is huge. I think that, you know, the thing that is a little bit more difficult about implementing, um, process improvement in an office environment is it's harder to see the improvements. Um, it's easy to see waste in a manufacturing environment. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you think about, for example, if you're on a, a shop floor and one of the wastes, you know, that we talk about with like lean and stuff like that is transportation. So that might look like, you know, they move apart from one side of the shop floor to the other side to do another step and then back to the other side to do another one. And so that's wasteful, obviously, because you're moving it around more than it needs to be moved. Mm-hmm. And so what they do is they sh- they rearrange the different workstations in a line, you know, kind of like the, you know, that you just hand it off to the next step in the process. And it's not having to spend time um, on a forklift going around, you know, the facility or or whatever. It's just, you know, right there quick, quickly to the next step. And so right. that's pretty obvious. You know, everybody can see that pretty clearly. You don't even have to have be trained in lean or continuous improvement. It's just sort of uh, common sense. Now, when you get to office environment and, you know, knowledge work, which is what a lot of um, what we do today is it's a lot less, uh, less, a lot less obvious. And, you know, there's, there's some opportunities you can make improvements. Like if you're in accounting department, uh, there was a case study I read of an insurance company that they had, um, you know, different floors of the building. They had a new life insurance policy they were going to review and each of the steps in the process had to go to a different person or different department to get reviewed. And they found that, you know, a lot of the the non-productive time was just spent in that application sitting in the inbox of the person in the next, um, the next step because, and, and, or in transit, you know, an inner office mm-hmm. mail it may take a couple of days floating around in the inner office mail before it hit the next person in the process. Whereas, sorry, my dog is, is dreaming <laughs> here. <Let> me... <laughs> <She's>... <laughs> sorry, let me try that again. Um, so, <laughs> so like, you know, instead of that thing floating around the inner office mail, if you had those people sitting next to each other, they could just hand it off. And so that is sort of the analogy in an office environment where maybe you're moving, moving paper or even moving data, you could have that same thing electronically. Uh, and so, so those are, 
you know, maybe it's less obvious in an office environment, but it's still, I think there's, there's plenty of opportunity to, to identify ways we can um, be more efficient and more effective in the way we do things. Well, and I appreciate that you used an example that was not related to oil and gas or industrial business, because that's something that we're kind of trying to push and convey on this podcast is that quality applies everywhere. It it really does. Yeah. And if you look at like Toyota, for example, they're like the gold standard in, in quality and uh, with the Toyota production system. And you think about the way that they do business, it's not just on, you know, the manufacturing process that they have the Toyota production system. It's in their sales process. It's in the service. It's in their accounting, you know, and in the financial side. So it's really part and parcel of the way they just run the business. It's part of their culture. And I think that's the, the thing that a lot of folks miss out on when they look at how they want to implement lean or continuous improvement and whether it's in an office environment or manufacturing or oil and gas, um, the the same thing applies. It's it's really got to be part of the culture. It's really got to be a situation where you have management buy-in at all levels. And it's not just um, those managers that have bought in telling people how to do it. It's really Mm -hmm. the people doing the work that are um, determining how their job should be done because they're the ones that know the best, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, that 20 year analyst that's sitting at the desk, you know, they, they know their job better than anybody in that company. And, you know, you tell them, okay, this is a new way we're going to do it. They're not going to buy into it. They're not, they may do it initially and they may follow your instruction, but then they'll go back to the old ways of working unless you have it really something where they take ownership of. And it's, it's, a a big change management um, opportunity, I guess, when you look at continuous improvement, it's not just the tools and the tactics that you implement to improve and document process, but it's really got to be a a change management journey that you go on. Yeah. It's how you implement those tools. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Because you think about the guy, the analyst that's doing his job, it's almost like it's a sales position. You've got to sell it to him. What's what's the added value of him changing what he's done for 20 years? Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think you know, people are, I think once you explain it and you, and you give them ownership of it, you say, hey, we're not here to increase your workload, which is, I think, a really big important thing to take away, no matter where you're implementing um, these types of things, whether it's lean or or whatever, is you got to be very careful about, um, you know, the worker and, you know, making sure that you're rebalancing the workload after you look at how you improve the process. So you maybe go through all those steps to, you know, map out the current state and document the waste and, and eliminate those wastes and identify that future state. But unless you go back and say, okay, how are we actually distributing this work across the different process steps and who's doing that, um, you could get into trouble because you could be overloading somebody in that in that process, which not only is not fair to that person, it's actually going to hurt you from a productivity and efficiency and a profitability standpoint because you've just introduced a new bottleneck in the system. You may have eliminated another bottleneck mm-hmm. somewhere else, but you just created a new one because that person is just overloaded. And so, so that's another thing you got to think about is, you know, you got to have the, the buy-in from the person, but then you also, and one way to do that, I think is to make sure that you're looking at that, that workload leveling and make sure that you're um, not overloading somebody. And then the other thing too, that I've found is one of the, biggest ways that this will fail. If, if any company says, Hey, we're going to implement lean, um, we go and identify some opportunities and the big focus is on cost reduction. And that's another term for, you know, like overhead. <laughs> and if they go through and say, Hey, we did this lean project. We identified opportunity. We identified these ways. We've streamlined the process. And by the way, we're gonna have to lay you off. And then all of a sudden you've created this distrust within the organization that 
nobody's going to want to follow this or do this process again because mm-hmm. they're worried about having a job. And it's like, I don't want to have to go through this and then worry about my job getting eliminated next. So, so I think that's really important is that people, you know, if you, if you go down this, this path is you've got to think about, um, the employee and kind of what's it mean for them and how do you use this to really empower them and make their life better. And in doing so, you're going to actually make your, your company more profitable and, uh, it's going to be better for everybody. So I think that's a, a big, um, red flag that I would say that if somebody goes down the path of, of doing something like, like lean implementation or continuous improvement implementation is if you start with that mindset of it needs to, we're going to look at how we reduce cost first and overhead, then you might as well not even do it. Cause I think it's, it's doomed to fail and you're just going to be making it worse. I think at the end of the day, cause you're creating this additional um, culture of distrust where it needs to be you know, if it's going to be successful, it's got to be um, something that is part of the everyday um, way that that people do their work. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And you look at it from just like how the, the, the employee, the end user is going to receive this, right? Is we need you to change the way that you work so that we can save money and you benefit none from it. That's Mm -hmm. a great sales pitch, right? No, no, it's not. (laughs) Um, On the other hand, hey, how about we do this so that you're not so stressed out at the end of the day? We've got some ideas that might work, but you're the expert at what you do. Can you help us out here? Now, that's a totally different sales pitch. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a huge. And then the other thing that's I think the big opportunity is 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 don't you know, it's like eating an elephant, right? You got to eat it one bite at a time. And the way you do that with like a lean implementation is use a pilot project and somebody that's already on board, you know, and a worker that wants to make their job better, wants to improve the process, you know, the manager that's, that's on board and then, you know, get senior leaders to buy in and then, you know, use that pilot, pilot project to generate success and to show a quick win that says, Hey, this is, this is really how this thing can work if we want to go down this path. And then the people that see the benefit of it, you know, the workers that see the benefit of it, they can say, Hey, this was great because I got to have input into how, how my job, you know, is performed. And for the first time I actually had a, I feel like I have a say in that. And it's actually part of the way that we're supposed to be doing it now. Amen. Um, and, and I had, I got, I had to contribute to that. And, and then, they become the biggest cheerleaders and proponents for that. And then it just snowballs from there. So I think if you find a real, you know, the, the low hanging fruit, find a real good opportunity, have a pilot project, whether that's in a department or a particular project or whatever it is, but then, you know, show that success and then start to leverage that as a way to, to go from there. I think it's, I think it's great. It's a great idea. Great, great way to, uh, to approach it. Well, we've done several case studies on our podcasts and the ones that always work well do exactly that. They start with a small team and they go in and they say, you know, what's working well, what's not working. And they get the team's buy-in to make the changes. Yeah, I think that's huge. You know, my experience, it's been, you know, if they're the ones co-creating it, um, you're going to have a lot higher um, rate of success in, in making those changes. And, you know, yeah, that, that, that's probably the biggest thing. And then, you know, the other thing too, I'll say is that, you know, we, we talk about, you know, we, we've talked about a couple of examples around kind of the analog world, right? The piece of paper that's floating around, you know, in a insurance company. But the big thing, I think, you know, in, in any industry nowadays, we're so technology heavy and, you know, the computer really dominates most um, office jobs is data is probably the biggest product that we we create. And so if you think about it from that standpoint, you got to look at not just uh, the obvious, you know, waste that we're talking about in terms of, well, I got to pass this application from department A to department B and it's sitting in inner office mail for two days and then we move them to be next to each other. And now we saved those two days out of the, the cycle time. That's great. But then there's you know, that example is probably maybe not even that relevant for today's day and age. Most of that stuff is probably electronic. And so you think about the application residing 
in a database somewhere and, and how do you, how are you moving data? And that's the other thing in like an office environment. I think the, the biggest thing when you map out these processes is, is the need to, to look at how the data is flowing and where are, where is there waste and how data is managed and where are the defects that you're seeing and are you having to re-enter data or is the data incorrect? And so there's some other things that companies can do around um, data quality management, I think, are, are, is just as important as the, the process management nowadays with, with this kind of world that we live in. So, I've seen one problem a lot of times, curious what your take is on this, is folks collecting too much data. You know, they've got a five-page form when maybe only one page of that information is uh, relevant. What have you seen in this area? You know, what are your thoughts about collecting too much data? Yeah, that's a great um, point because, and if you go back to, I think, our, our previous conversation where we talked about um, doing the the right thing versus doing things right. And so um, the thing that, and there was a really good blog post, I think you guys probably um, had that link in that previous episode, but um, it was on the Deming Institute website. I think it was around do, avoid doing the wrong things right or, and so that, that exact example you gave, you know, where you've got to ask yourself is why am I collecting this data? Is it a value added step or is that a piece of data that can be completely eliminated from that form? You know, are we using it anywhere? Right. So it's like, that's the question is you ask the customer, um, it kind of goes back to the voice of the customer, which is sort of the, the key concept, I think, with any continuous improvement um, process is, you know, getting pull from the customer and understanding what they need from the process and then really just delivering them only what they need because everything else is waste. It's overproduction, right? It's one of the, the forms of yeah. waste. So, and, and to be clear, so, yeah. the customer could be an internal customer, you know, whoever's mm -hmm. the, the recipient of this, the, this next step in the process. Exactly. Yep. And I would like to say I will probably be the one collecting too much data. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can relate, Darcy. I'm the same way. My <laughs> wife calls me a hoarder, you know, so I might need that in the future. You know, you never know. I just, I like the numbers. <laughs> I like the numbers that spell things out in black and white. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, if you ask yourself, you know, do I really need that? I haven't used it in two years. Okay, you can throw it out. So that's the, probably the analogy is, you know, that stuff that's sitting, you know, in your garage that you haven't used in two years. And you say, yeah, maybe we need to, to fill the Goodwill box and throw that in there because we haven't used it. And the same kind of analogy with, um, with the data we use in, in our jobs is, you know, do we really need to collect that data, um, you know, or is it something we can throw out, you know? So. It's just one of those things we've always done, so we're going to keep doing it. Yeah, yep. exactly. <laughs> yep. Well, I find that people are afraid to cut something out. It's like like you can see a panic o override someone when I start telling them, we don't need to collect that data, and they're just, you know, you can, the whole body cringes. Yeah, yeah. And it's it, it I think if you make it clear, so when you go through this whole process improvement journey, and you're, you're documenting the current state and what you're collecting. And then you talk to the customer and you kind of map out what the, the future state in each of the steps in the process needs to look like. And uh, if you're making it clear and documenting uh, what is required, then it becomes obvious to people that, okay, well, I can see we're not really using that. I don't need to collect it anymore. Um, I can make my job easier by not having to collect it. And once they get over that kind of mentality that, well, this is just the way we've always done things and say, and adopt this kind of, if they've seen, you know, I think like goes back to like the example I gave earlier, if they've seen the success in another department, let's say, and, and then people are talking about how their job is, is easier now because they're not having to go back and, and fix defects or have to search for information that they or, or data that they, struggle with before, and it's really more just readily available for them, then people will, will say, okay, I'm willing to make a change. And, and that's really, I think, why this is such a really a change management journey. It's just, a, it's, it, it's so important that the culture, um, this is embedded in the culture so that it's something that 
is continuous. I mean, that's the whole thing is continuous improvement. It's not yeah. a one-time improvement, right? So it's the, the whole plan, do, check, act. And it's the, you know, having that cycle that, that, you know, just keep going through that entire, you know, if you find a defect in the future, you have the new process, but then maybe it's not perfect. You got to find a ways to continuously get better and you identify those defects. You, you come up with a hypothesis about how you think you're going to change it and, and what the results would be. You figure a way that you're going to measure that and then you monitor it and then you make it visual so that people can see how it's going. And it could I be agree. that you made the wrong, wrong change. I mean, sometimes you have to go back and fix and change it again and, and do something different. But as so long as that's part of the culture that people are willing to to be continuously scrutinizing the way things are done and not accepting defects as part of the way of, of working, it's really just kind of that relentless pursuit of perfection, as they say. I think it was like Lexus yep. or whatever. So, <laughs> so yeah, that, that, that mindset. You don't have to have you know a master's degree and engineering or, or have you know 20 years experience to make some of these improvements though these are these are things that the average everyday person can tackle in their own office oh 100 percent. yeah it could be something as simple as you give a person a 15 minute training on here are the types of things that you know we want you to think about you know looking at look for these types of defects look look for these types of ways give them some examples and then They'll say, oh yeah, that's, I remember last week I ran into this thing and that, I guess that fits into this category called overproduction because I'm, mm -hmm. I kept, I just always been adding this extra date on this form. And even though I really don't need to, I guess maybe yeah. I could get rid of that. Right. So. I agree. I agree. I think that's, that's just so key here is that this is something that, that really anyone can implement in their office. You don't have to have, you know, a, a black belt and six segment. You don't have to have all of this. You, you, you can just take a little bit of time, like I said, just 15 minutes to training and that you can find online and, and you can tackle this yourself and make some real improvements that, that help you, that help your team. And, you know, maybe that guy doesn't have to work overtime anymore and, and he can actually get home to his family on time today. That's huge. Oh, it's, it's really huge. And people will be, um, totally on board. If you, if you do it the right way and you, like you said, you're making their jobs easier, they have more say into how their work's done and how, you know, and the other thing that's important too, I think from a cultural standpoint is that managers support employees when they identify defects. Cause one of the yeah. things that you can get into trouble with and the, the analogy in the manufacturing world and like Toyota, they pull the and on cord, they call it. And it's like the, the cord that stops the assembly line. So that's mm -hmm. if, in their step in the process, they're putting on a part and it's not fitting properly and it's something's wrong. Okay. They have the authority to stop work. And that means that entire assembly line, that entire plant can shut down because of that one person on the, on the line that says, Hey, this isn't fitting correctly. Um, I'm not willing to take the mallet out, you know, like the <laughs> example you guys yeah. gave, yeah. Yep. you know, with the, the Ford, I think it was, or whoever that said, yeah, we don't, you know, the customer will never know, right? right. Smash on it with the mallet. <laughs> you know, they're not willing to do that. And so they're, they, they stop the line and then they actually get together and they'll, they'll, the, the people doing the work and the manager, the team leader will sit down and say, Hey, what happened? Let's, let's look at a root cause analysis of what really happened here. And then how do we improve it? So it doesn't happen again. And yep in the office environment, I think you got to have the same mindset and managers need to be supportive of employees in, in pulling that and on cord, so to speak, and stopping the, the workflow and saying, Hey, this isn't working. I'm having to really redo this multiple times in order to get this to, to where it needs to be, to move it to the, the next step in the process. And so we, let's, Amen. let's figure out how we do this better. And, and then, you know, that they provide the resources to the employees to, to make those changes, to make things better. So I think that's a big, from a cultural standpoint, you got to have that in place in order for this to work. Amen. All right. Well, thanks again, Matt. Hey, so, so we can have this included in here. Where can folks find you and learn more about, uh, about you, about your podcast and what you do? Yeah, thanks. Um, so they can find me, uh, mineralrightspodcast.com. We're uh, also wherever you find your podcast. We're on all the major podcast players. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Matt Sands. Just look there. There, um, and then I um, just like I said in that first episode, I'll have some additional 
um, resources, you know, and, and articles and stuff like that, that I've come across that I've found helpful around the kind of lean office, um, implementation yeah. and so That's happy to, to provide that to your listeners. You could just go That'd to, great. yeah. So just go to mineral rights podcast.com and, uh, we'll do forward slash QM cast two. So, um, so yeah, thanks again for having me. It was, it was fun. No, man. We awesome appreciate it. Thank you. Hey guys, this is Darcy with Quality Matters. We really appreciate you listening. And if you enjoy it, we invite you to subscribe. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere you listen to your podcast. Subscribe, comment, leave us a review. We're happy to hear from you.